Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> My name is Ayelet. I'm the owner of the clinic. Happy to have you guys here. Um, just to say, some of you are familiar with us, some of you are not. Um, Integrative Wellness and Physical Therapy is a holistic wellness center. We offer nutritional wellness and physical therapy that's more of a holistic type of body work chiropractic, acupuncture, and ultimately teaching people how to live more of a natural, less inflammatory lifestyle. We work collaboratively as a team. So you'll be meeting Holly shortly. She's our clinical nutritionist here, uh, but she works hand in hand with our physical therapy and body work team to help provide our clients with a lot of education on how to lead healthier lives. Um, we're happy to have this lecture. This is part of a series of lectures that we do just trying to educate people on how to lead healthier lives and get more of a understanding about nutrition and how it affects us. So on that note I'm gonna bring in Holly. <laughs> Great. Well welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, we're always doing these experiments with what's what is the optimal night to uh, mm -hmm. do a talk. So. Uh, We've tried some Tuesdays, and, and this is a Monday and a Thursday, so we'll kind of see. So appreciate that. So uh, today we're talking about chronic stress. So most people would uh, kind of identify with that word. You know, we kind of use that language a lot, right? I'm stressed. I'm so stressed. It's so stressful. And I would say that um, in all of the clients that I see, it's probably the one thing that I could say is a big unifying factor, right? Stress or the burden of stress seems to be um, an issue for everyone. So that's why we thought we'd talk a little bit about ways to support that. I so try not to use that word. say that again. I, try not to use that word. I know it's a little benign almost, right? Because right. right. it's like, what does it mean anymore, right? You'll be consistently using it, and then then you'll get stressed out. So yes, exactly. <laughs> and a phrase I use. Yeah, it's true, and we kind of all get into it. It's kind of, and and some of us, I think, it's sort of like the way of you know, even in school, like kids are stressed, right? Everybody's stressed by all the demands on it. So, so this is just a little about functional medicine. Some of you may have heard of the idea of functional medicine. So this is a a, a really articulate description, but really what it's saying is that really what functional medicine does is really address the whole person, not just an isolated set of symptoms, that really looking by spending time and looking at history and genetics and lifestyle, that that's really the way we bring a body into balance. And that is what my training is in. So I'm a licensed clinical nutritionist, but I've had extensive training with the Institute for Functional Medicine that sort of looks at that. So even through my lens, while I'm not a diagnostician, I still am following these same formats, really gathering information about the totality of a person and how the body gets out of balance. So we always speak of getting to the root cause. And so even tonight, as we talk about stress or the impact of stress, we, we always like to, I like to use the analogy of kind of like pulling the microscope back and saying, you know, what is this whole story, not just this isolated, like, you know, I have rapid heartbeat. Well, let's kind of step back and look at someone's whole life to say, what, where is that? And so the tree is always a good um, image of that. You see, like, these are really these classic diagnoses. And then under here, these are some of the things that we might look at as potential imbalances for the body. So we talked about this already. So it's so universal. It's something that everyone understands, even if you go to Europe and, you you know, everybody's got a word for stress. And you know, with with the joys of our modern life and our technology, which everyone loves, right? We, we love our phones and our tablets and our Wi-Fi uh, in many ways. You know, those of us who remember when we didn't always have those, in many ways it's it's expanded us, but in maybe, maybe many ways it's created more stress because we kind of aren't really ever turned off, right? Even in working environments, you used to leave work. And that was it. Like, whatever you got done, you got done. And then you went back the next morning. Now, many people, oh, I logged in from home. Oh, I checked my email. You know, I worked on a project. So 
you know there's lots of uh, so I always like to start with definitions because you know as we said this word stress it's a bit overused and really used all the time so it's really your body's way of responding to any kind of a threat or demand so when you feel threatened your nervous system responds by releasing hormones and then that really sets the body up for an emergency so if we think of that, we're going to talk a little bit more about the nervous system as we go, but it's really kind of setting off this idea like, I got to run, right? So mm -hmm. so really, I always do the image of you've got a tiger on your tail, right? Or mm -hmm. something's chasing you and you've got to really run. So is it ever a good thing, stress? So we always think about the downside. So if we look at it as it exists in our life, so it is a normal part of life. Uh, our body is designed to accommodate it. That's why our nervous system has that capacity, right? And our body always looks for homeostasis. So if you think about, we'll think of a very simple example. You're on your way to work. You left five minutes later than you really wanted to. Like coming you get, here. Right, coming here. You get behind you know, the slowest dump truck in the universe, right, is going, and now you're a little stressed because you're supposed to meet your boss right when you get in the door and you're already a little late. So that's what we would think of as a classic stress. Now what should happen is whew, you finally get there, you run through the parking lot, you get in, depending on your boss, whatever, it resolves, right? It's over. You meet with your boss. Maybe he gave you grace for those five minutes, maybe not, but it should be done, right? It should be complete at that point. And so because the body is designed to accommodate it, it looks to rebalance like, phew, that's over. Now let's go back to normal life again. Uh, our body will always communicate when we're out of balance. So our, some of the issues that are the result of stress are really just our body's way of saying, hey, I can't do this on a regular basis. This isn't really how... I'm designed, right? I'm designed for there's a stress, it all works out, everything is even, maybe later that day there's a short stress, we work it out, and then we go back to normal. There's still stresses uh, at home from work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yes. Work, you stress. Exactly. You know, and so. You work, then you get in your car and then you're stressed again. Exactly. <laughs> and it's sort of how do we manage that, right? So mm -hmm. issues really lie in chronic stress. So we, if we want to really you know, be into specifics with our language, we could say it's not so much stress, it's chronic stress. So every day, most of the day, no breaks. And that's really how we get to disease because our body isn't wired for that, you know. Um, so this is, this, it, interestingly enough, there actually is an American Institute of Stress who oh, knew? I didn't know that. It's www.stress.org. <laughs> so that's that's interesting in itself. And I literally just lifted this whole list because you can see here, this is what they consider the impact of chronic stress on health. And if you read through there, it's pretty much everything you've ever seen in terms of the body being out of balance from depression, anxiety, heart attack, heart disease, a big issue, right? cancers, rheumatoid arthritis, so autoimmunity, multiple sclerosis, rashes, the GI system, I mean, look there, GERD, ulcer, irritable bowel, oh, yeah. ulcerative colitis, then mm. even degenerative neurological diseases. So we could almost say that it could really be a factor in all those diseases, but I'm going to guess that maybe those of you go to more classic doctors most people are not asking you, do you have a lot of stress in your life, right? Like, your blood pressure is really high. It didn't used to be. What's happening in your life, right? Are you really stressed? We don't often make those uh, correlations, but in fact, we know that in those situations, it's probably a factor. And it's really, I had a, I, I've told this story before, but it, I, it always stands out when I look at lists of diseases I had a professor when I did my master's program who was a little bit provocative. He was a, kind of an out-of-the-box thinker. He was a big researcher. And he used to always say, so often we have these long list of diseases and 
many of you could see like we're getting new ones, right? We get these new diseases that we have new medicines for that have these very specific names. And he would always say, you know, you wonder, are they really diseases or are they really just the body doing exactly what we'd expect it to do when we give it a certain set of circumstances, right? We're stressed, we're not exercising, we're eating poorly. What would we think our body would do? It would have to get out of balance. So is it really just a smart body giving us a signal to say, you know what, this is too much. I, I can't handle this. So it's kind of interesting as we see that list. So my picture shifted down. So three expressions of chronic stress. So this is sort of, this is really kind of narrowing it down into the most simple terms. So we could say physical or physiological. So we could have literally, I use the example of hypertension. There, so we have that physical stress and then we have our response to them. So let's say you're a person who has arthritis. So that could be in that effect of chronic stress. And let's just say as a result, you can't walk up the stairs very well. So now I have a, st I'm stressed about what gave me stress, right? So now my life is affected by it. So that's our response. Mental stress. How about that picture of Barack Obama? No politics here, but when he started and now. It's kind of, it's amazing, right? And most of us who have seen. They say that about all presidents. It's so true. We've seen it. Well, before and after the it are always like that, right? And so, and, and some of you may have had an experience for yourself, or maybe you have like a family member who went through a really tough time, and you see like, right, you see the effects. So that, in his case, he is always in an emergency, right? All night, you know, like long. So he's never like has a day where there's nothing to manage or think about. But that's a, a good example of chronic stress. And then there's emotional responses to chronic stress. So we have a lot of, we have quite an epidemic of depression and anxiety, right? From kids, the grown-ups, across the board, that's a huge problem that people have, you know, so that can be another expression of, of stress. So what I didn't say, which I'll say now, is we have a little packet of um, some, this is one of the, the documents that we will send you by email. So, you know, just some little charts and some things that, that are referencing what I've said. And this is one of the handouts that you'll get by email. So this really talks about the nervous system. So some of you may have known about this before, but it really divides it really into two parts. So what we call the sympathetic nervous system and that's the one that we sometimes know as the fright flight system. Some of you may have heard that, right? So that's the tigers chasing me. So the brilliance of the body is when that's happening, it takes the energy and drives it right into your extremities, right into your muscles. It gives you a little shot of adrenaline, right? A stress chemical. And it allows you to almost have a little superhuman capacity, right? So we all know that story on the news where like, you know, the 90 pound rock rolls on the kid and the mother picks it up somehow, right? And gets the kid out, right? Or the car, we've heard those stories. So those are classic like sympathetic, intense nerves where all the energy just goes so focused. What also happens, which I realize if you can't see it quite as well, but it actually releases some muscle contracting um, chemicals. Cortisol, which is one of those stress chemicals, happens to be very inflammatory. Mm. So this right. nervous system is the one that's supposed to be like a ninja seal, you know, in and out, we're done. We had our emergency, we cleaned it up, off we went. This is where we get into these problems where chronic stress, we'll talk about it more, can actually lead to blood sugar issues. Because cortisol, as that stress chemical, I'm in an emergency, I need all my energy to go into my extremities, competes with insulin, right? So what we see now, the challenge is I'm really not running from tigers. Usually I'm at my desk, right, when this happens. Most of us are sitting stationary and it's this virtual tiger, right, that runs, that kind of gets us all worked up. So 
that's where we start to see some of those effects of some of those stress chemicals on the body because the body's confused. Your question. I, can, I always hear cortisol be used for the belly fat. Yes. So, 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 so what happens is when you're chronically stressed and the cortisol is released by the nervous system chronically, what happens is it competes with insulin. So when that's running high, blood sugar starts to get liberated because the body thinks it starts to break down things to, to release some glucose into the bloodstream because if you're going to run, you need energy. When that happens, insulin goes, oh, oh, I think I'm up for a job. I see there's some blood sugar elevation because insulin's job is to try to drive sugar into the cells. So cortisol says, you know, insulin, I'm glad you showed up, but I really don't want you here because we're in an emergency and I need all of this because we're running from a tiger. And insulin says, oh, come on, I'm a storer. I love to store. Just let me store. So what it does is it captures that all and stores it as fat. And what? It captures stores it as, as fat. So that blood sugar that's been liberated, yeah. it can't get into the cells. Uh -huh. So it stores it as fat. And that's where we start to see that visceral adiposity happens from a combination of factors, but certainly high stress being one of them. So it... Wow. You start to see these sort of, then you start to make the connections like, oh, so stress and type 2 diabetes could have a correlation, right? Really stressed, not eating well, there's, there's a connection of how we Doctors, can, doctors never talk about that. Never talk about the lifestyle factors, right? So from a functional medicine perspective, we're always looking at 360 degrees of a human being. We're not machines we feed, right? We have, there's complexity to us, right? We can think about our family history. So some of us kind of come preloaded for certain imbalances, right? There's how we grew up, our, li our specific life events. And then there's these certain factors that get folded into that. So when the body's out of balance, we want to look at a few ways it may have got it may have gotten that out of balance, but we also are going to look at a few ways how to bring it back into balance, mm -hmm. right? So that's why, for example, if when I'm in a session with somebody, it's not just, okay, just eat these things and come back in a week. Mm -hmm. If somebody is really stressed, I'm going to help start to talk about that because if we don't get that managed, it doesn't, isn't going to matter how great they eat, right? Because we're not one-dimensional, so that's a perfect... That's a great question. And, and listen, here, here's what I'll say. Our conventional doctors are really smart people, and they're well-minded people, but they have 15 minutes with you at tops, right? And you're in there like you've got your 12 questions, right? You're trying to jam it all in because you know they don't have a lot of time. So, and they're not trained to think that way. They're trained to think disease, drug. You know, I've got an imbalance. How do I help this person? So we say that with all due respect. So functional medicine has a broader view, and that's mm -hmm. certainly how I'm trained, right, is to look bigger. So you can see as you look at this, and it's interesting that it's in red, right? Those are some of those factors. Mm -hmm. So the parasympathetic, which we sometimes call the rest and digest system, that's actually the one that should be running things most of the time. But for lots of us, it really doesn't happen, right? It's very rarely does somebody say, yeah, I'm good. I'm just chilling tonight. I got really no work. I got nothing on my plate. I'm, there's nothing really I'm worried about, right? I just did some exercise and I'm just relaxing. You don't really hear people say that. That's the system that really controls muscle building, right? So when you really want to have a, an anabolic state, it also releases um, growth hormone melatonin. So some of you may have heard of melatonin. That's about sleep, right? So how many of you either know or have had sleep issues? Yes. There you go. That's a huge thing. That's because this system isn't interested about sleep. Think of, think of the whole idea of veterans, right? So PTSD means, and most of you have heard about that, right? It's a big issue. What happens is they're always on guard, right? 
because mm-hmm. you don't know what's going to happen. So how could you relax and sleep? So when they come home and they're in their real, their beds with their family, they can't turn that off, right? They're waking up in the night and grabbing their guns because they think they, they, their nervous system is so overwrought. Well, on a micro level, that's what can happen to us as well. So when we're not sleeping, it's probably because we don't have this system on. It's probably because that parasympathetic's on. It actually repairs the body. So that's sort of the house cleaning phase, right? You want to think about parasympathetic. So when we're more stressed, we tend to get sick, right? We get colds and things when we're stressed because we're not getting this, what we will think of as building phase. It also stimulates digestion and elimination. So gosh, does any do, does anyone know somebody? You could probably name me five people you know of in your life who have digestive issues, right? Oh, I'm worried. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Either elimination or stomach or GERD, oh. right? Yes. This is the system that really runs that, but for most of us, this is oh. the system that's on, right? So what's also interesting about this system, and I like that's why I like this chart. First of all, it's normally active at night. So if we're not sleeping, that's probably not going to happen. And it also fixes the damage that the sympathetic nervous system does to the body. So we really want that system to be turned on, right? We want to activate that system. So we'll just take a little dive. So we just mentioned this. So chronic stress in the digestive system is really um, a very common phenomena. And as you all immediately put your hands up, both of your personal experience, but um, there was, I found, I was looking for some statistics. So over-the-counter gastrointestinal products, that does not mean prescriptions. That means something you can walk into a drugstore. $4.2 $4.2 billion was spent in 2014, billion dollars, mm. right? From people walking into a store saying, I got digestive. Yes, so all those things, the Nexiums, the Rolades, the, all of those things. Probiotics. It's, but that's a, that's a staggering statistic, right? So how does stress play that role? Well, first of all, fast eating. So how many people are fast eaters, right? Most of us, if you take, I would defy you to time yourself. If you take five full minutes to eat a meal, you probably are going pretty slow, right? Most people eat really fast, right? So when we're eating fast, our digestion isn't going to work because we have no teeth in our stomach, right? So if we don't do that, then that actually decreases our stomach acid. So we're hearing a lot of things about stomach acid issues. Then we get reflux and indigestion. Now, the paradox comes, and many of you have heard the idea with when people have GERD. People have heard of that, right? You know, people have reflux. Um, Well, GERD stands for um, gastroesophageal reflux disease. So this idea of reflux. We used to call it indigestion, right? (laughs) Uh Now we call it reflux, right? So the paradox is we're often told, oh, I have too much stomach acid. That's why I have reflux. It's really the opposite. It's too little. It means that the stomach is working really hard. Your stomach's almost like a bit of a washing machine when it kind of works. It has this contractive ability, right, with food. And when it has to work really hard, so huge meal, ate too fast, that stomach's going to be working really hard, right? There's no teeth in there, so it's got these, it's trying to try to break it down. And we get the splashing, right, because it's like working, working, working so hard. And then we get this diagnosis. So that I've done it. You know, you're at your desk for lunch. You really need to get that email done. And you're like (gasps) eating fast, right? Typing kind of. So if you think about our two systems, right? We talked about the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Probably the sympathetic's on there, right? Because I'm (gasps) got to get that done. And that's not the one who controls digestion. So the body is saying, really, why are we eating if we're in an emergency? You know, like, should we be running? So it's just interesting in a positive way to start to see, like, just some of these habits, how they impact. Now, digestion in the small and large intestine. So some of you may have heard the phrase that we sometimes say the the large intestine is also called the second brain. I don't know if anyone's ever heard that. There's a book 
call that? Yeah, so the enteric nervous system, actually that lines the gut, is the same as our brain tissue. So oh, that's, right. that's where that comes from. So when we have that stress, because we don't have the right system on, we decrease our transit time, which means that digestion slows down. So normally when we eat, right, we're really, we're just like, it's a big plumbing operation, right? We start at our mouth, it goes down through our esophagus into our stomach, goes into our small intestine, which is really long, and goes into our large intestine. Mm -hmm. And um, what happens is when we do that, everything gets slower. Then we get changes in intestinal flora. So probiotics, right? Some, some, we just mentioned that. So that's what that is, our bugs, our bugs in our gut. So when that happens, then that changes our gut permeability. We get this thing that we sometimes call leaky gut. Then that leads to elimination issues, constipation or diarrhea. Constipation is a big issue. I would say, oh, I don't know the statistic, more than half the patients that sit across from me have constipation issues. It's a big problem, right? People, people will come in and they'll say, oh, yeah, maybe I'll go, I'll have a bowel movement twice a week. No, no you'd be surprised, right? And, and people are not sort of tracking the impact of that. But we could actually trace that back to that stress on the GI yeah. system. Now, it's not the only factor, but it's just kind of to show you why we often want to speak about finding ways to calm that nervous system because you can start to see that by oh, doing so that, nice. it it uh, improves your health, right? It really improves your health. So a lot of people hear about IBS. Have mm -hmm. people heard irritable bowel syndrome? IBD is inflammatory bowel disease, so that's like Crohn's and colitis, right? So that's a more extreme example. But all of those are really sort of, again, this the way that we can have, see this impact of, of chronic stress. So then if we think about our immune system, so we talked about cortisol, right? Stress chemicals are inflammatory, so they're meant to be short term. Again, when the fire hose is kind of on all the time, this, those, those chemicals that are inflammatory, they become these little inflammatory molecules. So the fancy word we call them in medicine is cytokines, these inflammatory cytokines. It just means they're, they're these little molecules. They actually break down this, our immune system. So our immune system lives about 70% of it actually in our GI tract, interestingly enough. And it also impacts blood sugar levels. So we talk, we just talked about that, right? So those stress chemicals create uh, inflammation. The inflammation breaks down the immune system. Now, some of you may have known of somebody who has a blood sugar issue, has diabetes. And if you've known somebody who's had it for a while, they're likely checking their blood sugar levels, right? You hear of people doing that, adjusting medication if they're insulin dependent or if they're on other meds, they don't want their blood sugars high, right? That's always a challenge. You don't want it too high because that's very inflammatory on the body and the brain doesn't like that, right? So it's too much. So we can, you start to sort of see really the brilliance of the body, but how sometimes when things combine, we get kind of that layering effect. So high sugar foods, which interestingly are usually what people eat when they're stressed, right? Mm -hmm. So nobody comes out of a really bad meeting and says, I've got to have broccoli, broccoli yeah. carrots, right? <laughs> nobody ever says that. It's like, I'm getting a donut, I'm getting a Danish, I'm going to get an ice cream, right? So That's right. So it's kind of ironic. Um, but those, those sugar actually causes immunosuppression. Suppression. So... The sugar actually... What causes depression? Immunosuppression is the high sugar foods. So I've oh, heard, I've heard that uh, yeah. a teaspoon of sugar could, could basically sort of freeze your immune system for 30 minutes. See that? Uh, a teaspoon, teaspoon of sugar could actually kind of get your immune system a little bit frozen for 30 minutes in that frozen. it's... 
in that it's managing the sugar and probably not doing its normal jobs, right? So, and we'll talk about this because of course we're setting a context for solutions here, right? So um, high sugar foods are really a big impactor. And if we even think about, this is not that I'm a conspiracy, conspiracy theorist, but if we think of the way our holidays roll and how we get colds, we have Halloween, which is about the candy, right? Then we have Christmas and New Year's and Hanukkah, whatever you celebrate. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, right, that rolls right into that. Then we have Valentine's Day, oh and then we have Easter. And they're all about two months apart, give or take. And that's when most of us have our colds, right? And people will often get run down over the holidays, right? Oh, I was eating too much, I'm eating too much sugar. So I think most of us know that if we're doing that, we're going to probably create some immune challenges. So dysbiosis, so that's a really fancy word for having your gut bacteria, or what we are going to think of as those healthy bugs, imbalance from poor digestion and inflammation, which means that the immune system is, in, in a sense at that point, imbalanced. So if we think of our gut, our large intestine, our colon, they have all these different interchangeable names. About 70, 70% of our immune system lives in our gut. It's kind of wild, right? Like, and the way it lives there is in these good bugs. So they call probiotic is a phrase a lot of us. Some of you may have heard the phrase microbiota. That's in the news now. A lot of people are studying the intestinal flora. Those are all interchangeable. We know that there are about three trillion with a T bugs in our gut. We actually have more bugs than we have cells, right? We're kind of, my biochem teacher used to say we're just a big bag of bacteria, mm -hmm. right? So what we're learning about that is that like every good neighborhood, our gut's like a neighborhood. And you know, when we do urban planning, like across the street, they're building that that big complex, you know, they had to go to the town and say, well, what are you going to build there, right? We don't want a big commercial building next to these houses, so we like things to be nicely spread. Well, that's really how our gut is. We have all these different types of bacteria, but what we're learning is that it's about the quantity and the um, variety. We want different bugs. Different bugs have different jobs. And when those bugs get out of balance or depleted, and probably the most common way right? The co most common way we deplete our good bugs, most people are going to know this, right? What does your doc give you when you have an infection, right? Yes. So what's the problem with antibiotics, right? Is they're non-discriminating, right? They take out the good guys and the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And we see, right, that we see that depletion and then we see, start to see challenges. So um, when that happens and sometimes other things come up because now the good guys have been taken out with the bad guys. We want to we know when we have that, we have an imbalance. Sometimes people, let's say, oh, I had bronchitis really bad, and then I took an antibiotic, and then I got the flu, right? Three weeks later, I got the flu because I was very depleted from all of that. So, again, these are just sort of factors of how that plays. Did you it, say 70% of the immune system is in the gut? That's true, okay. yes. Yep. So these are some of the contributors. So we've, we've alluded to some of these. So these are both contributors and responsive to chronic stress that really lead again to these imbalances. So we talked about eating fast food, sugar, simple carbohydrates. I would probably say, from my professional opinion, I think that's one of the biggest ways that we contribute um, both a response. It's the most common response to stress in people's lives and it's one of the biggest contributors to our body getting out of balance. It's the simple carbohydrates, the pizza, the pasta, the crackers, the bread, the muffins, the yes. donuts, the all of those things all the time. Not occasionally, but all the time. You know, if we think of a standard American diet, I'm getting a coffee and a donut or a Danish for work. At lunch, I'm having, you know, a sandwich or a wrap. You know, I'm going to get maybe a treat from the vending machine at work. And maybe I'm having pizza or something like that for dinner, right? Uh, so, uh, 
It can be an addiction. I was just looking up some different ways that we responses to stress. So coffee certainly can be. So I'm that's a common one that people use when they're really stressed. I'm stressed. I don't sleep. I'm wiped out. I need my coffee to keep me going right through the day. I got to have that coffee at four o'clock because I'm like I'll never get through. So that's in a way becomes a response but it also becomes a contributor to, to that stress having a bigger mm -hmm. impact. So I will say if you're having regularly a cup of coffee at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you're probably doing, doing it as a drug, mm -hmm. right? It's probably to help you, you know, get through. <laughs> I think it's pretty common, right? To be drinking coffee at 10 o'clock. Yes, and, and some people, you know, some people clear caffeine better than others, right? Some people can do that and still sleep, but it's a little hard on the body because the exact reason that we, we drink it, right, is because it gives us that lift, right? It's like a shot, but yeah, everybody's different with that. And then, of course, things that can lead to stress, both contributors and responses is people shopping or over shopping is what I mean. People were you know, really stressed, and some people eat, some people shop. <laughs> and then technology, right? Games. So that's a huge problem from the nervous system standpoint. We, we know that you could, we could talk about it at length, but these screens, the Wi-Fi has an effect on our brain and our nervous system. A lot of screen time, that blue light, very stimulating for our nervous system. So it's hard, you know, it's probably a thing that we're always dealing with, right? Trying to get people off their screens at night. Um, one doc that I work with, he says, if you're a person who doesn't sleep, then you should turn your Wi-Fi off at night in your house. Definitely. One tip I would say is if you're a person who uses your phone as your alarm clock, take it, take it off the Wi-Fi. Put it in airplane mode at night so it's not generating that, that signal oh, all night long. Airplane. Yeah, just put it in, in airplane mode so it won't pull signal in, but your alarm will still work. Oh. That can impact sleep. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. if, you, if you leave it on... Then that Wi-Fi signal is just going through your bedroom all night long. But if you don't have Wi-Fi in your house... Then you're probably okay. Yeah, you're probably okay. Yes. And then, of course, you know, I just had to throw that cartoon in, the little goldfish in the blender, and you thought you there was stress in your life, right? <laughs> all right, so... In, in the yin and yang of every situation, we want to think about, well, how do we balance ourselves? So we'll look at this through a few ways. So lifestyle. So these are really this whole idea of how do we stay cool, calm, and collected. So breathing. Interestingly enough, exhalation turns on the parasympathetic nervous system. And I think most <coughs> of you will agree that you've had a circumstance where Maybe you've had a deadline or a project you were working on or maybe you're packing up a house or something and when you kind of get it done or get it wrapped up, we all sort of intuitively go, ah, right? We kind of do that sigh. Um, my own little theory is I think it's the body going like, good, let's switch systems now, right? We were like going really fast, let's switch over. So one of the things we'll send you are a couple of simple breathing techniques. So if you're a person, even so far you've listened and you're like, okay, that's me, but I got a lot of demands in my life. My job is busy and maybe I've got family or kids or parents that I'm trying to look after and I don't see that changing. It's really well, what are simple ways that we can start to take care of ourselves. So breathing exercises are a great way to do that. You can do them at a red light. You know, you can do them at work. It's not fancy. It doesn't require equipment. It's just a matter of doing that even even before eating just taking a couple of breaths yeah. if you're a person who has digestive challenges just doing three deep breaths before you eat tells the body like okay could we switch systems right can we just take that stress system off and put... i keep forgetting the parasympathetic system. so that's the rest and digest the rest and digest so sympathetic how i always remember is sympathetic stress sympathetic stress like the s's okay oh. parasympathetic is like that's the opposite that's, that's the chill one got it thank you yeah. so for me yeah, now i really can remember it so you open the window and take some deep breaths 
Yeah, and, and the other <laughs> thing that may work for you, certainly not meditations or visualizations when you're driving, you want to be tuned in, but finding some things you can listen to that are engaging that, you know, because traffic we know, aren't going to change, right? And particularly if you've got a commute and that's similar every day. MP3s are things you can download. So MP3s, they're little, when you go into like websites, you want to download music, they're the files. Oh, oh, right. What does it stand for? Mike Cortello. I can't remember it now. Uh, but what you can do is there's podcasts, there's all kinds of things you can download and listen to something that makes you feel good. Books on tape are a great thing to do if you're a person who's in traffic. Because you can't really change your circumstances, mm -hmm. you can only change your response, right? right. So that's a great way um, to do that. Um, doing some sort of relaxation, that can be very helpful if you have sleep issues. There's little simple five minute meditations or relaxations you can do before sleep that kind of helps you shut down some of those um, you know, responses where you just kind of all wired from the day. We talked about time off unplugged from, from electronics. So one of the things that we know is that, you know, trying to get off at least an hour before sleep, too, is probably optimal. You know, again, get off electronics like oh, computers, wow. your smartphone, right. tablets, right. for, you know, at least an hour before you actually go to sleep. So it starts to. <laughs> yes, I'm, that's true with a lot of people. Hi. That's true with a lot of folks, right? <laughs> so, uh, and then of course, getting enough sleep, right? So, you know, the old adage where people are like, oh, I only need four hours of sleep, that is just not true, right? We know that the sleep is where the body repairs itself, right? So, um, you know, trying to actually set aside time for sleep. Sometimes you can just feel really different from that. Simple. And then alcohol is a little tricky, right? So alcohol is, too much alcohol is, creates stress on the body. It, I know there's research about resveratrol and wine and all of those things. They talk about it a lot. <laughs> Well, what is too much alcohol? Well, it depends. That's where we, where you have to have sort of a bio-individual analysis, right? So it depends on individual. So in other words, oh. a specific Any. session geared to you. So if you're a person who has no history of any issues and you no know, alcoholism, no issues of any diseases are really low in your family, everybody lives long and there doesn't seem to be, then you might be a person who could have, you know, a small glass of wine, maybe you know, three, five times a week. Okay. But if you're a person who's really stressed, you have blood sugar issues, you have a lot of toxins, you smoke, you live in a place where there's a lot of pollution, you probably don't want to have a lot of alcohol because that represents another toxin. So it's really always the tricky <laughs> part about things that you see on, you know, the Today Show, it's like, People will buy books, you know, like diet books, which can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. But then they'll really be like, you know what, it didn't really work for me. And it's like, well, it was a broad stroke. It was yeah. really meant for a lot of people. And so that's where sometimes you have to have that really kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, so this would be the one that you might expect me to most talk about, right, as the Ooh. nutritionist. So food. Um, so interestingly enough... Um, I had a, a patient last week who was eating pretty well, but she had so much stress. Her life, her job was so stressful that I felt like we needed to tweak and we needed to work with some of these, but she was a great example of somebody I felt like even if we did a good job of these, if we don't marry it with the lifestyle pieces in her case, probably going to be a limit to how far we, we go. So... Um, so, of course, veggies and fruits. So, what we all know, we've all been told, no matter what age you are, your parents, your grandmother, somebody was always telling you, eat your vegetables, eat your vegetables, eat your vegetables, right? That's always been the mantra. Well, we know now that the science really supports that. It isn't just like a rule that comes somewhere, you know, down through the generations of grown-ups that they just want you to eat your vegetables. Um, we know that 
vitamins and minerals are in fruits and vegetables, fiber. And then there's this new part called phytonutrients. So as our science has progressed, we now are looking at what are really the colorful pigments that come in fruits and vegetables. So let's say the things that make broccoli so beautifully green, those pigments we're learning are really powerful and they are really healing. And that's the place where we sometimes start to incorporate this phrase food as medicine is where we look through uh, particular vegetables. So sometimes we'll send you a little chart about eating of the rainbow. So the more, you know, I always say, I, my dream is to have a patient who eats too many vegetables, right? That I have to just say, hey, that is just too much broccoli. You gotta cut that back, right? It doesn't happen. So the more ways that you can get those in, the more creative ways, the better, right? So um, if, you're, if you're a person who doesn't love them and you eat none, try to eat one a day. If you feel like you do pretty well, can you just add another serving? And then sufficient protein. So we talked about blood sugar balance. We talked about um, this idea of the parasympathetic nervous system being a system that really builds the body. So getting sufficient good quality protein helps our immune system and our blood sugar balance, which is a big factor when we're talking about stress. So the question is always asked, well, what is sufficient? What's the right amount of protein? So I think we can generally say for an average adult, if you're aiming for about 60 grams in a day is probably reasonable. So that's we'll say three ounces at a meal. So a size of like deck of cards is about four ounces. So you wanna be having about three quarters of that, let's say at least three times a day. Now, some people probably need more, but if you're a person who doesn't eat a lot of protein, if you're the person who does oatmeal for breakfast and a salad for lunch and you know things like that, then you probably wanna look at that because that usually helps. I was vegetarian for quite a very long time. <clears throat> Excuse me, and but I used to eat a lot of soy mm -hmm. at that time. Yes, and then I started realizing that I needed to decrease the amount of soy in my diet, right? Because of the phytoestrogens, etc. Yeah, and I wasn't getting enough. I wasn't getting enough protein, so I finally had to look at that and listen to my body. Mm -hmm. And so I started. I well, I was eating fish for quite a while, but and um naturally raised, uh, cage-free, free, free yeah. and all that, yeah. chickens and turkeys. What a difference. Yeah. I feel so much better because I have enough quality protein. Yes, and, and I... And I it and some people are... I, you know, and that's a, a phenomenon I see a lot. So particularly if your body's out of balance, we probably need a little bit that's more protein, right? Um. I'm, you know, being vegetarian is great. I'm always going to be a fan of people eating a lot of plants, right? We just talked about the benefits of that. But, um, but I don't think we get enough protein. I think that when you're a vegetarian, you've got to be a little mindful yeah. of what you're eating. It's Make sure you're eating so beans and quinoa and things to get your protein in because what happens a lot of I times know. in those diets is it's very carb heavy. You're right. People do brown rice and they do, you know, breads and crackers and, and things like that, but they're not doing as much. Well, even beans are high in carbs. Well, they are, but at least a bean is, a, yeah, is probably a good, good fiber. So, um, and then healthy fat. So some of you may remember we were very anti-fat for a long time, right? Everything was low fat, non-fat. And my personal opinion is I think that is what's led to the epidemic of type 2 diabetes because as you remember when you looked at those packages they had so much sugar in them mm -hmm. right and the salt. snack wells remember the snack wells right, right. those were a big thing <laughs> yeah exactly which is why people ate the whole box right because they weren't there was no satiety there wasn't any satisfaction right. so now we're taking a more balanced approach to say you know we probably need those healthy plant fats and there's even a trend now for diets maybe that are a little more emphasi emphasizing a bit more fats over some other mm -hmm. things. So certainly the plant mm -hmm. fats seem to be where the research is. So olives, olive oil, coconut oil, um, avocados, mm -hmm. nuts and seeds. 
think that I'll be speaking. Okay. Um, those are all, you know, good, you know, and, you know, I usually say, like, try to have a tablespoon at each meal of them. You know, that's probably a good target. Like, tablespoon? Yeah, meal. like, make sure you drizzle some olive oil over your veg or on a salad or something. Um, and I would say that if the general thing of this slide, if you kind of leaned towards the slide, I think you're probably going to be pretty healthy. Did you have yeah, a question? Yeah. If what? If you follow this slide... You're probably going to be pretty healthy. Oh. I mean, that's a that's a. If I could sum up what I think is a really important thing to focus on. Mm -hmm. Did someone have a question? Did you have a question? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, we want to avoid. So we talked about sugar. Sugar is just really hard on the body, right? The mouth is about the only part of the body that has any happiness with sugar. <laughs> when the mouth's finished, the rest of the body is like, yeah, this is not great because we're. You know, it has all the things that we talked about, you know, being inflammatory, it being, um, uh, you know, depleting immune system, and even in processed or packaged foods, right? So a lot of you may follow a gluten-free diet. That's, a, that's a, a common, more common phenomenon now that people try to avoid gluten. Um, I always bring this up because people think, oh, I'm doing that because it could be healthier. There, it could be. But the problem comes with gluten-free products, right? If you look at them, yeah, they're not that healthy. Junk food, most really? of them. Oh yeah, By any other day. <laughs> they really are. When you read the package, if in terms of the processed, right? You read and it's like tapioca starch, potato starch, white rice flour. So oh, now no. I've got all these carbs. Oh, no. So there's still a lot of simple carbohydrates. So, <laughs> are you getting a hard time there? Yes, they're they're going. They're giving her a hard time about, uh, what was it? Jake has some questions about oh, gluten-free. Gluten yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, please. Like it's like, no, see, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's it's actually a pretty viable topic, and, and we could use it in this context because we're really thinking about it. So for some people, gluten is a stress on the body. So for some people, it represents a challenge on their digestive system, certainly autoimmunity, Things people have backgrounds with any kind of mood challenges, um, even um, people who are prone to depression, anxiety. Can that can gluten can be harder on the gut? There seems to be there's components in gluten that are called gluteomorphins. It's a part of the breakdown of gluten, and you might hear in that word a familiar word, morphin. Mm -hmm. Sounds like morphine, right? So for some people, those components are like brain chemicals in a way. So some people, sit, go ahead. Are they like depressants? They can be, yeah. yeah like they got yep. dopamine receptors. Yes, exactly, like the second brain. So we, I have absolutely seen patients bipolar, patients with ADHD, patients who are just adult patients who are having challenges with mood or anxiety i've seen people it's not i can't say universal but i've seen people feel better when we take gluten out when you take gluten out gluten of their diet out. the right. challenge comes as we said is what what are you eating instead and so we're always going to have an eye to whole real foods wherever we're living so yeah. if you're gluten free you want to be having brown rice you want to be quinoa maybe a plain brown rice wrap or something you want it rather than gluten-free pretzels gluten-free cookies gluten-free right so that's the dance yeah i i have that issue too and i've noticed and gluten-free bread yes foodies, gluten yes bread, which i just love but i've noticed it's not healthy really it has all those things in it you just it does so for me it's always about so balance once in a while, yes so you have it sometimes or you make your sandwiches open face or right. you look okay, at just yeah, ways to said, trim yeah yeah, but so once or twice a week, maybe. And right. sometimes we choose our battles. So I've definitely had young patients, right, who we need to take gluten out. And sometimes we do swaps. We just say, all right, the first phase, let's just swap everything for a gluten free product just to get to shift to see if we can feel better. And then maybe we can say, can we bring in more whole grain? within that world. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are different ways to work with it. You So brown rice, I know you've mentioned that before, and I always thought that that was a really healthy grain. But then I thought I had been hearing that it's arsenic. inflammatory. 
It really Green. depends. Greens, it, it really depends on the person, right? So, oh. oh, as we were saying. Yes, yeah. So for some people, that's a great transition. Some people, particularly who have very high inflammatory conditions, like somebody who has really bad arthritis, um, fibromyalgia, um, maybe rheumatoid arthritis, things where they're really having these chronic you know, really manifested inflammation. Sometimes there can be benefit to trying a grain-free diet mm -hmm. to see. We, it's a good experiment to see. Some people do feel better if they are off so grains. It's kind of individual. It is, but I would still and choose it. Balance. Yes, I would definitely still choose it. I'm sorry. Yeah, some people can have gluten just fine. Well, here's what I'll say about gluten, though, in this category. Very few people cook wheat grouts, right? That's not how people are eating their, their gluten. They're eating processed food gluten. So sometimes people will take gluten out, and they'll feel better, simply because they stopped eating a lot of processed food, right? Oh. They took out pasta and pizza, the things we talked about, the things people eat all the time, bread and cookies and all those yeah. things come out, and they feel better. It can be from the gluten, but sometimes it can just be because they cleaned up their diet and they're not having a lot of sugar. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I would say the impact of gluten it can be measured. So these are just some things that you can look at. And, and I think what I would say really, the, for me, the takeaway point with my bias as the nutritionist is food is really powerful. Food is really, it's really powerful. powerful. Pro yes. and con. Don't underestimate the impact. I have seen people's lives turn around by just changing what they eat with no, no other changes, just changing what they eat. So it's, um, it's a good factor. So this question comes up a lot, so I always like to at least speak to it. So about supplements. So if we, we set a context that we know certain lifestyle factors have, are, are a way to shift the stress the impact of chronic stress. So we talked about, you know, unwinding, doing some breathing exercises, turning off electronics. Can you do some meditation? We can even say exercise there. Then we talked about food. How would you work with food to help? And then supplements. So these are what are some of the basics. Um, so multivitamin is often helpful, particularly if you're not always feeling like you get all your vegetables in every day. Omega-3 fats, fish oils, a lot of people are familiar with that. So there's so much research, profound research, about the anti-inflammatory benefits of omega-3 fats. Vitamin D, most. I've hardly seen a patient that's not deficient, and even ones that live in Florida, who you would think have a lot of sun exposure. Uh, low vitamin D is, is related to immune issues. Very strong connection between type 2 diabetes and low vitamin D. What, what's... Um what food can you eat that you get vitamin D? You really can't. That's the thing. Well, so the what food would you eat for vitamin D? D. D. So supplementation is, is probably most preferred. You know, a lot of us cover ourselves a lot in the sun. We're worried about other issues of sun damage. Ideally, in, in the summer months, so there's a, a doctor by the name of Michael Hollick, who is the world's expert on vitamin D, who... Mm. At, Funny story, I'll tell you, this is always interesting how these things progress. Years ago, like 20 years ago, he started to make some connections with vitamin D. He was a dermatologist and thinking that was a major factor for immune health. And he was kind of laughed out of his profession. I mean, he was really like, you know, shunned. Like, you're crazy. Why are you doing that? Now he's like the world's leader in vitamin D. So I guess he's laughing about that. But mm -hmm. he says, for those of us in the North... Uh, from probably June till September, the best way to get our sun is from the hours of um, 10 to 2, 20 minutes, arms and legs exposed, exposed in the sun. Mm -hmm. Nobody does that, though, right? Who <laughs> goes out between 10 and 2 with their arms and legs exposed? Well, we get the vitamin D if we have sunblock on? You don't, no. actually. So that's what I'm saying. Arms and legs exposed. I mean, like no sunscreen. You can burn and in 20 minutes. Some people can. Well, you don't actually, you don't actually. Yeah, and and there's different people have different you know nationalities, right? Some of our heritage. I have a very good friend who's like a hundred percent Italian, 
I got the 55 sunblock. She's got nothing on. And she's just, it's so, you know, we're all different with our sun. But I think supplementing vitamin D is probably pretty common for most people. I think that's one of those supplements probably everybody would benefit from. What is the name of this doctor who's the expert? Holick. H-O-L-I-C-K. Michael Holick. H-O-L-I-C-K. Yep. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, it's just, it's actually a hormone more than a vitamin. It has a lot of jobs in the body. It actually is. And then probiotics, right? We talked about probiotics. I think probably most people benefit most people can can use to have their immune system supported. Jacob just said that we can like take the vitamin and put it in our food. Can you? You can you, you can do that with some that? yeah some supplements. Mm -hmm. Some people do that. Open them take up. The vitamin and put it in like, oh, your food. Oh, yeah. Some you people can't that. swallow pills, right? I'm actually, I have a very hard time swallowing supplements. I get a gag reflex, so a lot of times I'll open stuff up and put it into my morning smoothie. Mm -hmm. So I'll put the vitamin D in there, and I'll put the capsules. It doesn't taste nasty. Right. No, because it's, it's just like fish oil. Stuff, so yeah. I, mean, I don't put in fish oil. That's a whole other yeah. story. Right. But, you know, honestly, other than that, a, yeah. and there are definitely companies that make fish oils that are good quality, but they put in natural sweeteners, so it's not as horrific tasting as you can Yes. yes. So the gummies, because we get the gummies. They just have a lot of sugar. Yeah. 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 No, no, I know, but I'm just saying eating those. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Nordic, I think, naturals. And Designs for Health, they have ones that are better quality than the gummies, but they're still chewable, and they don't taste terrible. Yeah, Yeah, which is a good segue, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a second, but that's a good segue, so I always... Like to say, as a matter of fact, um, that's what my um, newsletter is about next week, is that supplements, they are not all equal at all. Right. So, you know, it's, um, there are a few over-the-counter brands that could be reasonable. You know, we here at uh, Integrative, we actually sell what they call nutraceutical quality. So their supplements are only available to providers, health providers. And they're from companies that do a tremendous amount of work and research with the raw materials. One of the challenges with supplements is that most raw materials come from China. Oh. You know, China doesn't have always the best record for, you know, low toxicity, right? We have a lot of issues with China. So the companies we use are testing, sourcing the raw materials, testing the raw materials, testing them when they're put together, testing them you know, six months later, three months later, just to, to make sure. So uh, I I always say better to take less of a really good quality supplement mm -hmm. than take a lot of a poor one that you're not even going to absorb. So what what about, what do you know of the um, various supplement companies that health food stores promote? Like There's a couple, factors, there's like a couple solar, that are good. Yeah, I mean, now. across the, the board, there are a few, I think, um, New Chapter is a pretty good company. Oh, yeah. right. New Chapter Rainbow Light does some yep. good things, um, but it, that's a, a very tricky subject because a lot of them. For example, I'm a Costco girl. Love Costco. Love the whole experience of Costco. <laughs> but I can't really say that I think the supplements you would get there. I mean, if you get this many, yeah, for like right. twenty nine ninety nine, how Any good could it be, right? right? So you know, you kind of have to sort of think about that, right? How yeah. high quality could something be if you're getting like five hundred? The possible exception of vitamin D. Vitamin D is a very affordable supplement that you can probably get almost anywhere. You're probably doing okay. And then sometimes, you know, we use a little, some people need a little sleep support, right? So there's a few ways you can work with some simple nutrients that can help with sleep, you know. What would they be? Well, it depends again. So some people have melatonin, some people 5-HTP. Um, there's actually lavender oil is actually... There's a supplement called Lavella, which is just lavender oil. Really? There's been a lot of research done. That's a nice one because it doesn't really interfere with anything, you know. As a, It's a capsule, yep. Yep, oh, really? a little gel cap, yep. Good research done on that one. But there's different ways to support sleep. Again, we're always going to look at that whole picture, right? We're going to address lifestyle, food movement and then the supplements again to me are just that supplementing what else we're doing um, and then so you may I, I want to leave some time for some other questions but you know you may I'm not sure that's not my computer
I don't know, this this just went a little crazy here. Yeah, click on that. Okay, great. Uh, so we talked a little bit. I always like to offer this first, uh, you know, nutrition sessions here. Um, I offer anyone a 15 minute free consult. So if you're kind of thinking, I don't know, or I have somebody who I think could benefit, that's an easy way to find out where we just have a chat and see what's your story and if how I think I can help. Um, and then, you know, from that, if that, if we think it's a fit, then we set up a one hour session where we have you fill out all the paperwork nobody likes to fill out, but gives me really good information. And um, it's, it's kind of a great way, I think, to, um, because uh, I'm going to distinguish myself slightly to say that I'm not an average nutritionist in the terms of because I've had training in a lot of things where we don't always just talk about food, right? That is that functional me medicine lens. Yeah, because not all nutritionists have functional medicine. That's true. There's many skilled uh, out there, but, right. you know, it's a little bit more comprehensive. Right. And, uh, and then I want to uh, just leave time if anybody has any questions or... Thoughts or um, oh, I have one. I, water. <clears throat> I don't like. I really do not like buying spring water in the large plastic. Yeah. I don't like plastic. Yeah. Period. But I don't know. A water filter is really effective. Just the little simple one you would put on your faucet. Because that's what I would have to use. Yeah, there's a few of them out there. It's it's a it's a complex subject. There's two that I know of for sure that work well. One is called Berkey, B E R K E Y, B E R K E Y, and they're basically you put them. They're kind of like big stainless steel kind of. I don't even know what you call it. Like Contain. urns in yeah. a way that you put on your counter okay. and. Pretty, I've seen some pretty amazing uh, research with them and really clearing out. My brother actually has one. He has a large family, um, and they use it off their counter for their cooking, and then they keep some in the fridge, you know, that, that well, refrigerate. You... It's got a highly, high, high-resolution filtration system in it. So you pour the water oh, in, it filters it's it. It's not from the faucet. It's this mobile... Well, it does come from the faucet. It starts from the faucet. You pour it into this filtration system. I see. That's a nice one. You, that's probably going to cost you in the neighborhood of two hundred dollars, I would say. Okay. Another one is B E R K E Y. Water system. Yep. Or yep. They have them on Amazon. You can find them. Another one is called ODAK. O D A K. O D A K. And a nutritionist friend of mine who has a large clinic in in uh, Florida, she did extensive research, and this has a very high level of. Um, micron filtration that takes everything out and really I would will say this recently um, a couple weekends ago I did a, a, a functional medicine module on detoxification mm -hmm. and so they were talking about some different things and water was definitely one of the things that came up as a very easy thing to make a very profound change actually water and air Having an air filtration system and a water filtration system, all the docs all agreed, based on the research of how we get exposure to things, mm -hmm. that those two things would be a, would be a great thing to have in your house if you want to just right away to have a really profound impact on your detoxification. Wow. Probably especially if you have a... Um, so the ODAC takes out wood stove like burner. Yes. Yep. Air filtration is big. Level. Oh, a lot of research on, on our exposure coming through the air. Air pollution is one of the oh, big, sure. most profound ways that we get that. But with the ODAC one, it, it's That's for it water. a high degree of... Yes, so it has a real... Yes, it's a really micron filter, so it really takes things down to like the 0 .001, you know, kind of 1 100th or 1 1,000th one of... Chlorine and fluoride uh, Yeah, it takes... It, they're very good systems, what, yep. Do you have an air What's filter? The the best thing I say for air filter, there's a doctor by the name of Walter Crinnon, C-R-I-N-N-O-N. -N -N. He has a website, and he sells, he recommends those from his site, and that, he's a naturopathic doctor who's been a naturopath for quite a while, and this has always been his focus, is detox, 
cleaning up. And so I would trust what he would have to say. I've heard him speak. Yep. Jake had a question about um, what kind of water? What, distilled water? Distilled water. So he was just saying, oh, we're just for drying. drying stuff out, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's not so good to drink because of the loss of um, Mineral. minerals. Yeah. They say it's a little hard, so it's better to take, you know, a water, like a faucet water. and Plus, it's usually coming in plastic bottles. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. another okay. one that Jake always talks about <laughs> is he kind of looks at people who go gluten, um, gluten free and is like, oh, it's all in their heads. It's a fad. Well, right. well, um, it's okay. very trendy, isn't it? Yeah. It's very trendy now. Oh, I'm gluten free. Right. Right. Well, we've yeah. already dispelled that myth, right? <laughs> right. So I, I think that, as I said, sometimes taking it out improves people's health because they take out junk, right? Yeah. They take out simple food unless they do all the substitutions. Um, but gluten and dairy, actually, so we talked about the, the gluteomorphins, and there's also something called casomorphins in dairy. Mm -hmm. But also the gluten itself, the pr that protein, is known to be a gut disruptor. So it can break those tight bonds, right? The, those um, uh, epithelial cells, right, that line the intestine where our immune system is living. So they're meant to be like a stone wall. Uh, gluten is a notorious breaker of those junctions. And it's also the, the way, the quality of the gluten that we get, right? That's a big factor for us. Many people have gluten issues in the States. You've heard this, I'm sure. And then they go to Europe and say, I was funny, I was fine. Mm. I bread was oh, fine. No, they have a very yeah. different plant, right, yeah. than we do. Oh. So a lot of it is the plant. Um, yes, the plant? the plant, the wheat plants that we have have been hybridized so many times to be good plants, right? But they're just not good foods anymore. So that's really it. But it can be trendy. Yeah. And I've seen hundreds of patients really totally change the quality of their life by going gluten-free. And what about GMO? Jeez. What about what? Jacob what you doing? He's always arguing with me about GMO. And oh, he yeah. had all the research on it and how it's so beneficial it for the world. Well, and it depends on how we bet. I'm saying it's beneficial for a lot of people. Yeah. Third parts. The, I would say the spirit of it, we could argue in some cases, could be to say, can we hybridize a hardier crop, right? By The challenge comes with things like glyphosate, right? Roundup is, is the most well-researched, off-the-chain research about how it is disrupting our guts, leading to neurological issues, inflammatory itises, you name it, horrible for the body. So... So that's where we're saying, you know what, I don't know if the spirit is really what's behind it. I think it's more the financial gain. Yes, it's corn and soy are the most foods, common yeah. ones. Our yes. Yep. Modified, yep. Depends on what you yeah, well, you could say really a seedless grape is something genetically modified, right? But what we're to, what we what I think of is that, right is the GMO foods are that classic Monsanto, the Roundup, right? So when we're breeding in, that's different. When we're breeding in a chemical into a plant, is different than saying, can we grow this plant so that it doesn't have seeds because we get more yield? I think they're two different subjects. I'm just saying that if you can't like. But but it's probably what we would eat here, I would say, probably wouldn't be great for us. And I, I know that the docs that I've worked with who've been docs for a while, they're all scratching their heads going like the kind of crazy things they're seeing in people, these crazy gut things, these crazy inflammatory things they're saying, you know, there's there there's definitely starting to make a correlation with how food has changed with some of the, you know, kind of pesticides, of course. Makes sense, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, the pesticides are tricky, right? Because yes, so it's it's always.